Good, good afternoon. I'm delighted to welcome you to today's um, seminar in the professionalism series. We're delighted and honored that Dr. Holly Humphrey is able to join us um, and speak to us today. Uh, Holly and I go back a couple of years uh, to uh, today's uh, where we were both uh, medical students and uh, interns and residents, and no, not, not at the same time. My, we, we were separated, separated by a generation, but, uh, but it does go back a ways. Uh, as you know, um, uh, Dr. Humphrey is the um, Dean of Medical Education at the University of Chicago, um, highly regarded nationally as one of the leading medical educators in the United States. Um, uh, here at Pritzker, um, Holly took the lead in developing the Pritzker Initiative, uh, the, the curricular reform for the 21st century. Uh, and Holly has also um, launched the Roadmap to Professionalism Initiative with colleagues. Um, nationally, um, when, when uh, Dr. Humphrey was the uh, uh, head of the program in internal medicine, she also was the president uh, of the program directors in internal medicine. And since then, as she moved from there to the dean's office, she's become the chair of the American Board of Internal Medicine. So uh, it's hard to think of anybody who has received more acknowledgement and recognition uh, for contributions to the field of medical education than Dr. Humphrey. Today, uh, Holly will talk about case studies in medical professionalism, a view from the front lines. Holly, we're so glad you're here. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much uh, for that wonderful introduction. I'm glad you clarified that we uh, weren't in uh, the exact same medical school class. Um, in all honesty, Mark was one of my teachers when I was a medical student here. And I have continued to learn from him over the years since I was a student, as we all have. I want to say at the outset um, a thank you to Dana Levinson, um, who helped uh, put this uh, presentation together. There are a number of different uh, angles that I could have uh, taken with the presentation today, but I thought I would try to build on what we have learned as a group, um, beginning with the fall seminar series that I thought was um, very elucidating and uh, interesting, and you'll see that some of what I'll present will touch on some of the conversations that we had in the fall. Let's get started. Um, I do intend to address this uh, question of the definitions of professionalism. And then I'd like to share with you what some very important accreditation expectations are in this domain of professionalism. Because I think in many ways, the accreditation expectations force um, a lot of not only the conversation, but the behavior that medical schools and residency programs are engaged in today in 2012. And then um, to try to make the point and drive the point home, I'm going to ask you to engage in some problem solving experiences through a few case studies. And I will conclude those case studies by posing what I believe are some unanswerable questions. However, it's possible that as a group, you will persuade me that um, there are in fact answers to some of what I'm posing as unanswerable. And then I will conclude by um, inviting you to think about the impact that mentoring can have in helping us solve some of the questions. And I think that everybody in this room has an opportunity um, to be engaged in a mentoring relationship on one level or another. I won't go into that topic in um, great detail given some time constraints. So I think. Early in this seminar series, in the fall, we had an opportunity to think about the major principles of medical ethics that, in fact, form the foundation for the whole conversation and all of the published literature on medical professionalism. And I know that many of you who are real experts in the field of medical ethics um, may be content to leave this topic of medical professionalism right there with those four basic principles of medical ethics. You also know, um, given the presentation that Lainey Ross did in the fall, that a more contemporary definition of um, medical professionalism was done by the American Board of Internal Medicine Foundation and the American College of Physicians through the Physician Charter. And that um, 
charter is based on the three principles which we covered in the fall as well as the professional responsibilities that um, the charter calls each physician to adhere to. Now, as I have listened to the conversation in the fall and being well familiar um, in particular with the physician charter, it gave me an opportunity to ask myself the questions of why is it that this topic of medical professionalism creates so much controversy and so many questions and conundrums? And I've certainly had the opportunity to think about that when our own medical students have um, pushed back on um, instruction related to medical professionalism. I think that the lofty goals of uh, medical ethics and the lofty goals of the uh, physician charter are in fact aspirational in what they intend to invite us all to aspire to. But I think the, the real essence of this conundrum gets back to the, the fundamental definition um, that we would find in any major dictionary. And that fundamental is that the professionalism is focusing on the conduct or the qualities that characterize or mark a profession or a professional person. And it's in trying to set expectations for conduct that I think we run up against some real dilemmas because I think they can very often stray a long way away from those fundamental high-minded ethical principles as well as the principles of the physician charter. I also think that um, today this concept of professionalism is often applied to groups that would not historically have been thought of as representing a profession such as athletics according to uh, Merriam-Webster uses athletics as the example. Um, and if you were to look in the literature you would find that um, a whole host of groups are using the term professionalism to describe the work that they do and the group that they happen to be a part of, whether it's veterinaries or nurses or um, individual employees at Walmart. Now, Herbert Swick um, published in Academic Medicine a set of um, expectations for physicians that he believed um, incorporated the contemporary definition of um, professionalism. And we've had a chance to talk about these multiple times over the fall. What, in fact, physicians do. They subordinate their own interests to the interests of others. They adhere to these high ethical and moral standards. They respond to societal needs. They evince core humanistic values. They have accountability for themselves and their colleagues. They demonstrate continuing commitment to excellence. They have a commitment to scholarship in advancing their field. They deal with high levels of complexity and uncertainty, and they reflect upon their actions and the decisions that they make. That's a very long list. So with all of this background, um, one reader who posted his comment on the internet said that that list actually read like a combination of the Boy Scouts Code, the Ten Commandments, the Golden Rule, and the Pledge of Allegiance, all lovely and legal, yet impossible to adhere to and enforce. Platitudes and pedestals warm the cockles, but reality is chilly. I think in many ways we have heard that point of view um, in this seminar over the course of the fall, but now let me show you what in fact um, physicians say when they have a chance in focus groups to talk about what they think of as professionalism. And what I'm showing you is basically a word cloud that was developed uh, by the American Board of Internal Medicine Foundation after doing a series of focus groups with uh, practicing physicians, largely in small and mid-sized um, group practices when they talked about their work as physicians in the community. This is the word cloud, and one thing that gives me a great deal of uh, reassurance is that the very center of the word cloud is the patient. So when physicians talked about their role as professionals, it was really their interaction with patients that drove um, their conversation in the focus groups, as well as these qualities of compassion and honesty. Everything that you see on the word cloud in um, smaller font and uh, lighter text are things that were mentioned in the focus groups, but to a less um, extent. OK, so um, with that background, let me show you what the accreditors 
expect medical schools to do. I'm going to talk about the LCME, which is the accrediting group for medical schools, and then the ACGME, which is the accrediting group for residency and fellowship programs. So the LCME has, a, has several standards that uh, are, are going to be very much related to this topic of professionalism. One of those standards is ED23 um, related to the curriculum. A medical education program must include instruction in medical ethics and human values and require its medical students to exhibit scrupulous ethical principles. They go on to say that the medical education program should ensure that medical students receive instruction in appropriate medical ethics, human values, and communication skills, and adherence to ethical principles should be observed, assessed, i.e. evaluated, and reinforced through formal instructional efforts. Okay, that's ED23. The phrase scrupulous ethical principles implies characteristics that include honesty, integrity, maintenance of confidentiality, and respect for patients, their families, other students, and other health professionals. The next standard is a relatively new standard, and it applies to the learning environment. Um, the standard 31, a medical education program must ensure that its learning environment promotes the development of explicit and appropriate professional attributes in its medical students, their attitudes, behaviors, and identity. It is expected that a medical education program will define the professional attributes it wishes its medical students to develop. As part of their formal training, medical students should learn the importance of demonstrating the attributes of a professional and understand the balance of privileges and obligations that the public and the profession expect of a physician. Keep this in mind when we get to case study number one. The medical education program should also regularly evaluate the learning environment to identify positive and negative influences on the maintenance of professional standards and conduct and develop appropriate strategies to enhance the positive and to mitigate the negative influence. And then there's a standard related to outcomes. A medical education program must collect and use a variety of outcome data, including national norms of accomplishment to demonstrate to the extent to which we meet these objectives, and that we should collect that outcome data on medical student performance. The kinds of outcome data that could serve this purpose include assessments by graduates of the school, by residency directors of the graduates preparation in areas related to the medical education program objectives, including the professional behavior of its, of its graduates. Now, the Association of American Medical Colleges, which is one of the two main parents of that accrediting body, the LCME, convened about a decade ago a task force to, to provide guidance for medical schools on how we should report the performance of our students to the outside world, specifically how we should report the performance of our graduates to the residency programs that they're applying to. That report is um, called an MSPE, the Medical Student Performance Evaluation. And it, the report is about 50 pages long, and it has a whole series of recommendations for schools. I'm going to focus on only one of those recommendations right now. And that is the recommendation that medical schools should provide a comparative performance of professional attributes of all of our graduates in this MSPE, previously known as the Dean's Letter. So no longer a letter of recommendation, today a letter of evaluation. And the recommendation from the AAMC is that medical students should be reporting on the performance of our graduates as exemplary, adequate, or below average compared to their peers. That's what this uh, arrow means. How does this particular student compare to their peers in the domains that were put forward by the AAMC? Do they treat patients compassionately? Are they exemplary, adequate, or below average? Are they honest? Do they have integrity? Again, exemplary, adequate, or below average. Do they respect others? What is their ability to communicate? Do they advocate for patients? Do they put others first? And let me remind you that we are one of a growing number of schools in the country that um, is a pass-fail, competency-based school. So for us, this, this um, promotes an extra conundrum. And I will tell you that we do not currently adhere to um, this recommendation. <laughs> okay, but keep that in the back of your mind. 
Okay, now what about the ACGME? What about the group that accredits residencies and fellowships? They also have um, accreditation standards on this topic, and they say that they must integrate the following ACGME competencies into the curriculum. And one of those competencies is professionalism. Residents must demonstrate a commitment to carrying out professional responsibilities and an adherence to ethical principles. Residents are expected to demonstrate, okay, here we are, the conduct of the profession compassion, integrity, and respect for others, responsiveness to patient needs that supersede self-interest, respect for patient privacy and autonomy, accountability to patient society and the profession, and sensitivity and responsiveness to a diverse patient population, including but not limited to diversity in gender, age, culture, race, religion, disabilities, and sexual orientation. So that's the expectation from the ACGME. Now, with that background, I want to invite you to come with me to the front lines. <laughs> Let me say at the outset um, that the cases I am about to present are based on real incidents which have occurred in our own medical school and uh, medical center. However, I have changed um, some of the details in order to protect the privacy of the faculty and the students um, who may have been involved in these. Okay, so let me take you to rounds on the general medicine service and a commonly encountered conundrum of the pressure to discharge a patient. So the patient is an 85-year-old woman with end-stage renal disease on peritoneal dialysis. She had a fall at home and came to our emergency room where it was de determined she needed to be hospitalized for placement. Over the course of um, the hospitalization, uh, the team noted that there were several other diagnoses, including high blood pressure, diabetes, and glaucoma, and that she lived alone in a second floor apartment and had no known family members. So um, the team caring for this patient needed to um, not only evaluate and care for her, but then work on this uh, issue of placement. And as they tried to do that without um, family support in place and the need for the um, patient to be on peritoneal dialysis, which the patient wished to continue, um, the team began to feel a lot of pressure from um, the Utilization Review Committee to discharge this patient. I'm sure that some of you in the room have found yourself in this situation and I'd be interested to know um, if you have found yourself in this situation, how you have handled that? In my experience, nine times out of ten, you know that it is the case the patient needs to be in the hospital, but it's not been documented clearly. And so with some easy, um, an easy fix is to just make sure that you're um, team is documenting clearly that the patient needs to be in the hospital according to the guidelines set forth by the Utilization Review Committee. I just think that it highlights that actually being able to advocate for your patient is such a key part of professionalism in the sense of knowing the ropes and unfortunately that does mean knowing a lot about coding these days and, and the different sort of requirements of, of uh, managed care that I, I think maybe none of us like but uh, is, a, is a real reality. And okay, from, excellent point. From the, oh, just from the other side, on utilization review, they also have a, you know, sort of an obligation societally and, and to the institution as a whole as well as sort of to all the patients. And I believe a lot of them, as, as Vinny said, are very uh, amenable to negotiations and understanding sort of how to do things. So. Okay, great. My first question is, have we discussed with the 85-year-old that we're th talking placement and are we removing her from her home and does she know this and is she consenting to this and to how much does she have a say in everything that's going on. I understand why it's hard for her to live on a second floor apartment, but she's been doing it for weeks and months and years with all of these other comorbidities. And what's pushing us and does she really agree to it? Yeah, that's an excellent point. And I know that the team was actively engaged with this patient and the patient actually did wish to return home with some extra um, supports in place if that could be arranged. However, 48 hours was not enough time to um, get all that in place. Okay, well what ended up happening is um, utilization review uh, was literally placing a, a lot of pressure on this team, in fact involving uh, the department chair to um, move the patient out of the hospital. 
Um, we talked about how the attending physician might manage um, the patient. Um, we didn't necessarily think about the role modeling aspect for residents and students um, about the highest standard of care. However, I think the comments that you shared were very much um, applicable as positive role modeling experiences. Um, what happened in this particular patient is that the patient was worked up for a pulmonary embolism. There was um, potentially uh, an episode of shortness of breath overnight. And while the index of suspicion for a pulmonary embolism did not seem to be um, very high, it, um, it wasn't completely unreasonable. But I just invite all of us to think about the cost implications um, when we're ordering tests. Um, so the patient got one extra day for being worked up uh, for a pulmonary embolism. And then um, the second thing that happened is after the pulmonary embolism was ruled out, once again, uh, utilization review had made arrangements for the patient uh, to uh, go home. Um, however, in the evaluation of the patient, the team um, discovered that the patient was actually severely malnourished. And um, the team was also working this patient up for uh, whether or not there was a swallowing uh, disorder, whether or not there were other issues in terms of caloric intake, et cetera. And in the end, um, the patient actually had a feeding tube placed, which um, got the patient another additional day in the hospital. So um, this case obviously has a whole host of um, avenues that we could pursue about patient management, about the role modeling for, physician, for uh, students and residents who are on this team, and about really ultimately doing our best to take care of patients. Um, ultimately, this team was able to find outpatient peritoneal dialysis and a home health care nurse, and the patient was, in fact, discharged home. Now, um, I want to invite you to think about how should the attending physician grade the student for professionalism on this rotation, because professionalism is one of the, um, the domains that the attending physician is going to need to complete at the end of this rotation. Now, I haven't really shared with you any of the data points for what the student's role um, in the care of this patient was, but certainly as an observer, the student had an awful lot of data points of their own to see what transpires in a hospital when a patient um, with this condition gets it admitted. Given what you heard transpire um, during the management of this patient, do you think as an attending physician you would be in a position to evaluate the student in the way that the AAMC is asking us as medical schools to evaluate our students? If you were strongly advocating to get the patient out as quickly as possible and the medical student was coming and telling you that he thought that wasn't a good idea and that the patient's not ready, then you would probably give them a, maybe a higher point for advocates, but then maybe a lower point for, uh, um, well, the reality of the situation. I mean, <laughs> I mean, the fact of the matter is it has a lot to do with, with the attending's own perspective on what would be the ethical approach to, to doing this. And I think a lot of, of how we end up uh, evaluating medical students is how well they, you know, how well they fill their role um, in sort of living up to our expectations of what we think they should do in any given situation, which is always going to be different depending on our perspectives about it. Yeah. And so the smartest medical students, the best medical students, I think, are the ones who are able to perceive what it is the attending has in his mind about the best, uh, the best uh, way to be and, and can act that way, unfortunately, in some ways. But I, I think, you know, if the, if the attending was, you know, advocating you know, is more like Javad and saying we're not going to listen and the medical student, you know, went along with that, you know, I think that would be fine. If, if the medical, if the attending was saying we got to get this patient out as soon as possible and the medical student um, really gave them grief about it, then I think there may be a problem. That if the student begins to ask questions, 
from my perspective, um, they're going to get higher grades on professionalism. So if they say, ask a question, should we be gaming the system? Is that what advocacy for our patients really means? Well, well then, uh, you know, honest has integrity becomes uh, something um, significant. And I, and I think that's a real serious professional question raised by this case that hasn't been so far. And if a student raised it, I'd give them high, high points. So, mm -hmm. so um, one thing that you should know is that feedback that the medical school receives from the students um, is plentiful and um, very constructive almost all of the time. But one of the common themes that um, is a part of that feedback over many, many years is that the students often feel um, the evaluations in the clinical arena are very subjective. And so to the extent that um, you and I work together to make our evaluation of the student as explicit um, and known in advance so that they have less a feeling of the subjectivity, the better. Okay, um, let me move on and um, tackle case number two. This particular case um, involves a student, an interaction uh, of a student with a nurse. This is a third year student um, who was in the operating room during the surgery clerkship. One of the surgical nurses believed that the student had become contaminated um, during an operation and asked the student to step out of the OR and to scrub in again. The student disagreed and in fact an altercation ensued, a verbal altercation ensued between the student and the nurse. In fact, the student gave the nurse the finger in the OR. And um, at that point, uh, the attending physician asked the student to leave the operating room. There were a few other factors which came to light. Um, multiple other students had actually complained of mistreatment, specifically bullying by this same nurse in the past. Um, and the student had earlier reported comments made by this nurse regarding the student's religion, uh, which was Islam, um, which were felt to be disparaging. Okay, so this is um, a complicated situation. And I'd like to ask you, first of all, how should the medical school respond to the incident, holding the student accountable to the highest standards of professional behavior? That might be the first thing um, we try to tackle here. <laughs> Aside from the background issues that may have, you know, gone on in the past uh, between this student and the nurse, I guess my sense is the nurse is the boss in the operating room, and if the nurse has the impression that the that the student uh, contaminated herself, uh, that's a patient care issue, uh, and I think that. Uh, the student has to abide by that even if she believes that it didn't happen uh, because you know I think that the the nurse in the OR is trained to be on the lookout for these sorts of things and you know it may be that she was wrong or maybe she really does have it in for the student but we don't really know that and I think that that she's the boss and, and the student has to comply even aside from what background there may have been okay good Jeannie we can't control others' behaviors, but we can only control our reactions <laughs> to their behavior. And regardless of what the, whatever the motivation was for the nurse's behavior, clearly the student's lack in judgment in the way that he or she responded really is something that is sort of in, in complete contrast to this professional behavior expectation. Okay. I, I would just, I think, echo what others have said. I think that one important thing that Dr. Hoffman pointed out, which is that you know, you have to know sort of who's the boss of what. And although it's a team effort, I think that this concept of what's sterile and what's not sterile is largely the nurse's responsibility. And I think that um, it is, it's absolutely the case that there may be other issues. There may be issues of bullying. Those are all important things. But ultimately, everything should go towards benefiting the patient. And no matter how upset the student would have been, their response in no way benefits the patient. And so I think that that, to me, would make that particularly problematic. Great. So one thing to just um, keep in the back of your mind in, um, as we think about the next question is 
to consider the mitigating factors and the impact of the institutional action on this student's future career. Um, so I already explained to you that the medical student performance evaluation is this comprehensive assessment composed by the medical school faculty regarding a student's performance. It's supposed to compare him or her to their peers in achieving the educational objectives of the school. It's neither a letter of recommendation nor our prediction of the student's future performance in a residency program. And so um, one of the things that um, we are asked to report as a medical school is, was the student the recipient of any adverse action by the medical school or its parent institution? Okay, so that's the expectation. We complete these, le these letters um, for all of our students when they're applying for, for um, their residency program. And so I'd like to um, share with you what the medical school actually did. The Committee on Promotions actually put this student on academic probation for three quarters. Remember, the student was a third-year medical student. So the student was put on probation for basically the remainder of the third year of medical school and uh, the first quarter of the fourth year of medical school. At, and the, when a student is on academic probation, the faculty committee on, on promotions would have an opportunity to discuss any students on probation at each of those meetings. So the student doesn't just go on probation and then they get forgotten about. Um, they go on probation and they get discussed at every meeting uh, with updates on how are they performing, have there been any other incidents um, in any of the other clerkships, um, what, what are we hearing from the faculty about their performance? Um, the student was actually removed from academic promo probation at the end of the summer quarter before the MSPE was released on November 1st based on the fact that there were no further incidents of unprofessional behavior. I will tell you, however, that um, during this time that the student was on academic probation, and before the committee took the student off of academic probation, there were multiple meetings that the student had um, with me, with lawyers, um, and phone calls and meetings with this student's um, mother. However, the committee um, was independent of um, all of that activity and made the decision to remove her for, from academic probation for the reason that I mentioned. Um, the, one of the deans in the medical school met with the surgery um, clerkship director to discuss the student's concerns related to the um, surgical nurse and um, provided mistreatment report data um, that we collect from the students in aggregate and that the AAMC also collects from our students at the time that they graduate from medical school. The surgery clerkship director implemented a mistreatment intervention in the Department of Surgery for um, faculty, residents, and clinical staff. And I can now tell you several years later that intervention um, seems to have been very successful in that we have today much um, lower reported rates of mistreatment on all of our clerkships, including uh, the surgery clerkship. When the closest thing to an analogy happens in the first year, what do you do? And by that I mean that, like, here's the third year, it's a specific example, it's easier to put a handle on it in terms of, well, potentially unprofessional behavior, although there were quite significant extenuating circumstances. When I look at like, the two cases and maybe what you're driving at, a lot of it's going to come back to those fundamental principles that have been sort of poo-pooed in the beginning and you know, how we treat people, treat people as individuals. But like in the first year, there clearly are going to be times when unprofessional behavior occurs, but it's sort of in some ways harder to you know, pigeonhole and say, well, okay, you know, we have a clinical example a situation, and we can then put this person on probation. But in some ways, it's at least, if not more important, to sort of address some of these issues early on. Yeah. And so how do you deal with the analogous situation when there may not be as easily formable structure to deal with it? Yeah, that is an excellent question, and in and of itself is a topic for an entire um, lecture. But as a result of of trying to find the right balance between these accreditation standards, behaviors that we know take place in the classroom and in the clinical environment, and trying most of all to um, promote the care of the patient as the highest priority and the proper professional development as a development in aspiring physicians. 
several years ago, um, with help from our students and faculty, we developed a um, whole system of professionalism reporting. And I see Shalini Reddy in the very back of the room. Um, Shalini led that task force. And Shalini, do you want to just stand up and say a word about how we would manage that today if we um, encounter an incident of unprofessional behavior in the first year or the second year, whenever it happens, but we are specifically trying to capture it in the first year. Um, so I sit in the back in the hopes that no one will call on me, but <laughs> that didn't work. So um, in the first two years, if an incident occurs, uh, the clerkship director or the course director has the option to complete a form. And on this form, you, the, the particular individual, the faculty member, provides a description of what happened and um, refers to whether it uh, falls in the category of uh, an egregious violation of professional behavior. Once that form is completed, the student meets with the clerkship director or the course director, um, goes through the form, provides their input, and then that goes on to uh, further reporting in the, um, in the medical school with one of the medical school deans. And then what in that determines whether there's a pattern of behavior or if this is an isolated incident with the knowledge that people are generally good, good people sometimes behave badly, and good people sometimes get put in bad situations. So, uh, What's the proper form for evaluating um, these kinds of, uh, this kind of standard of professional behavior. Um, and the question is whether we want to sort of where, to find out where students lie on a continuum between, you know, Dr. Welby, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, some horrible person at the other end, um, or do we want to simply um, be able to sort out those persons who fail to meet the professional um, standards um, and to flag those and to say um, that either they can be um, uh, you know, rehabilitated, if you will, that we can help the, you know, call those people out for special um, attention and try to get them to realize that their behavior needs to change, um, or to say that that um, is incorrigible um, and that they don't meet the standards to be um, uh, able to practice professionally. And isn't that what, you know, more what we're after than saying, you know, you've got an A, B, C, uh, or D on professionalism on each of these. Um, I think that's a serious question for um, the profession and the evaluation of professionalism. Yeah, I, I think actually that is um, very well stated. And in fact, in some ways, I think um, at the root of the conundrum we find ourselves in, because I think that um, the accreditation standards drove evaluation at a point in time when we were not prepared to be properly evaluating people. And so I think that there's a lot of angst in the community about, about how we do this and do it right. Um, it, this was an opportunity for remediation. I mean, it, it, was, it was an outrageous behavior. The patient was not taken into account and, in fact, was put at some risk with all this stuff going on. Uh, lack of impulse control, M merely putting such a student on probation for two or three quarters without also offering some intervention in a, in a constructive way, even if it weren't done in the um, operating room, but subsequently um, u using all of the resources we've got uh, to teach people about professional behavior, I, I think would have been worthwhile and could, have, could be seen here as an opportunity missed. That, that's one point. My second point is that if I were the program director receiving this student for whatever residency, I got to tell you that I would like to know that this behavior happened. Um, I might not do anything about it, and it, it, it might, as you, you fear, put the student at some risk of not being selected, but, by, but for sure, I'd keep an eye on this, this student as they started the independence of a residency program. Yeah, so Mark, those are two great points. And let me say, even though I didn't have it here on a bullet point on this slide, this student had multiple interventions at a very high level. Oh, really? Um, okay. Yeah. Attempting to um, put this whole incident in the perspective of um, the patient in, on that table in the operating room. Um, I think, I mean, my own assessment um, is that the student over time did develop some insight. Um, I think the mother also 
um, <laughs> helped. Uh, <laughs> helped. Um, now, was it a perfect intervention? I certainly don't say that it was, but I can tell you that the student just did not get a letter from the good, Committee on good. Probation at Promotions, and we let it go. There were multiple meetings with multiple people Thank you. for exactly that intervention. The other thing that I want to say is that when we are thinking about the professional behavior of students and residents and faculty, we're really looking for patterns of behavior. And to the best extent of our ability to collect data and make observations, we are, after all, a pretty small medical school, so we see our students in ways that other schools may not. Um, this was a single incident. And so to report it to a residency program, and I can guarantee you that if, if that had been in the MSPE, this student would not have matched. Yeah. Now, this student did not go into surgery. In fact, I will tell you this student did not go into a direct patient care specialty. Hmm. However, this student did match in a non-direct patient care specialty. Um, but I know if this had been in the letter, the student would not have matched. Now, maybe this student really shouldn't have matched. But my hypothesis is, as a former residency program director, is that the residency period is the period in which the number of data points will increase significantly. And so if, in fact, there is a um, professional behavior problem, it isn't going to um, go away. It will come up again and again and again. And um, the residency program then needs to be prepared to make the observations and intervene. Now, the real issue is, because we have this new system that uh, Shalini Reddy um, described with we may well have students for whom we have a pattern of unprofessional behavior. And if and when that happens, um, we will, I believe, as a medical school, need to include it in the MSPE. And I think it will have very significant consequences on whether or not there will be a residency in that person's future. How do you think about it from the perspective of maybe like an international medical student? And because I know a lot of them don't match, but. I'm just thinking from their perspective, they were, you know, hardworking and didn't have or had zero, you know, professionalism incidents. Um, it just seems a little concerning that maybe our student would get it over them. Um, I mean, I understand the perspective that we don't want to harm our own student's career, but there, it's kind of an idea of a zero-sum game that there are other people not matching because our student is matching. Yeah. And I didn't know if there was any thoughts on that. So, for example. We do share data very freely with a group of um, 12 other medical schools. So we share numbers, we share case studies, we try to learn from one another. So if, if I were to get an MSPE from one of the peers with whom I share data and kind of keep an eye on how much are other schools revealing. And in fact, from time to time, I ask our own residency programs if they can de-identify letters from other medical schools and let me look at them so I can keep a sense of what are other schools reporting in the MSPE. I certainly don't have that kind of firsthand data from the international community. So I know what the numbers tell me, but I don't know the, the quality of their evaluations or what would be in their letters of recommendation. So I think um, while I want to keep that global perspective in mind, I, without having the data, I don't feel like I'm in a very good position to try to answer that. OK, I'm going to um, move past this third case, um, but assure you that we actually have several cases that um, would be fun to, to try to ask and answer. So what are some of the unanswerable questions? What is moral behavior in an immoral system? Um, now there's a big one. How, how do you learn to be professional in a broken healthcare system and in, frequently in a broken society? And what is more important in professional formation? What we know or what we experience, see, or feel? And I do think that these three questions would be questions perhaps for um, more than just a one lecture, but um, perhaps a series of um, conversations. So um, it seems to me that in thinking about at least these two cases, there is an intellectual response that we can have. And we can base our intellectual response on hopefully some common basic principles. There's also an institutional response, which we try to follow, um, and in fact do follow, at accreditation expectations. And then there's an individual response. And I want to put forward the idea that perhaps an individual response can be framed in this whole um, concept of memes and mentoring. 
So what are memes? Well, memes are a lot like genes. Um, this is a term coined by Richard Dawkins, where the memes are the cultural analogs to genes in that they self-replicate and they respond to selective pressures. And they are passed on from one mentor to mentee. And actually, um, two investigators, Chernoff and Nakamura, make the case, actually quite compellingly, that memes and the cultural analogs are transmitted over generations. I think um, we know about mentoring lineages um, from our day-to-day -day, um, enjoyment. But the work that's actually been published shows some very powerful mentoring lineages, one of the most powerful being in the field of physics, where the laboratory of J.J. Thompson was the laboratory that first discovered the electron, Rutherford, the laboratory um, that first discovered um, radioactivity. And every one of the persons in this mentoring lineage actually ultimately became the recipient of a Nobel Prize over now multiple generations. So um, one of the frameworks that um, has been proposed by Delos as a way by which adults learn is this framework of challenge plotted against support. And uh, Delos proposes that when adults are in situations of very high challenge, medicine and medical education would probably fit that definition, the optimal is to have a support system in place that is also equally high. And if that's the case, then growth occurs. If, in fact, the challenge is high but the support is low and or punitive, stasis occurs. If the challenge is high um, and support is low, retreat occurs. If the challenge is low and support is high, confirmation of one's ability. And then if the challenge is high in support, is growth, the most optimal. So let's see if we can apply this to um, our student. How should the medical school respond to the student incident in the surgery clerkship? So if the challenge was low and the support was low, we could blame the student. We could ignore the nurse's role. We could hold the student accountable through academic probation and include everything in the MSPE, as we've discussed. If the challenge is high and the support is low, we could blame the nurse, absolve the student, no adverse reaction, OK? Retreat. Not much learning taking place there, probably. Um, if the challenge is low and the support is high, we could confirm, address the student's concerns regarding mistreatment in the surgery clerkship, and completely ignore the student's behavior. Or, ideally, if there's growth, we could address the student's concerns regarding mistreatment, but hold the student accountable through academic probation, providing um, the student an opportunity to redress the issue. Now, does this same framework work, to work for case number one? How should the attending explain his or her actions to those for whom he serves as a role model in managing the patient who's been admitted for placement? In many ways, I feel like this one is really hard, and it's the kind of thing that we had a chance to talk about earlier. Um, stasis, the attending could simply say to the student, what can you do? It's how the game is played. We're gaming the system. Um, the attending could say to the student, this is why I'm planning to leave academic medicine. I'm joining a boutique medicine practice in Hinsdale. Um, the attending could say to the student, I'm very troubled by the choices we were forced to make. I base these decisions on the harm which might have resulted from an early discharge. And several of you actually suggested um, that. Or we could try for growth. And I have left growth as a question mark because I don't think it's obvious um, how to do the very perfect thing when the system itself is somewhat broken and, and society is not all on the same page about how we should fix this system. So that gives us opportunity, I think, for further reflection and further conversation. And then we didn't have a chance to, um, to talk about case number three. But um, I wanted to show you that, well, actually, Given um, time, I think I'm going to stop right there and um, see if there are any other um, questions or comments or areas that you'd like to explore before we wrap this up.
um, you make a compelling argument for not um, reporting this student as a single incident. Um, but then I think I heard you saying that um, in the case of repeated incidents which were um, not remediable, um, that you would consider including it on the dean's, dean's letter. And I wonder if that's adequate or whether the school would be prepared to take um, the stand of saying this person doesn't meet the standards required to graduate from the Pritzker School um, with a medical degree. Um, and what it takes to do that, and are pre we prepared to do that on the basis of professionalism. Yeah, so I can actually answer that with two um, specific examples. One example is of a student who had um, repeated evidence throughout medical school of uh, serious issues of unprofessionalism. And um, that student became very familiar with um, how serious those issues were. And um, ultimately, after um, six years in medical school, was able to clear the hurdle, the multiple hurdles, um, for graduation. However, the, the details of the, of the unprofessionalism were a big part, uh, I believe, three paragraphs in the MSPE, maybe two, but um, was definitely in the MSPE. Um, the student had an opportunity to see what um, was in the MSPE, and the university lawyers also signed off on that, you should know. Um, and the student ultimately had a very small number of um, interviews in a, um, what we would consider a less competitive field. And at the end of um, the first year of training, um, the student has done well. Um, I don't have the sense from that program director that the student is um, the star of that program, but the student, um, to my knowledge, as revealed by the student and by that program director, there has not been um, further evidence of the kind of difficulty that they had during the time that they were our student. So that's example one. Example two, is that um, we had a student get to the summer of the fourth year of medical school actually without any difficulties in the prior three years, at least not any difficulties that were on our radar screen. And Before the radar screen had been. <laughs> yeah, yes. Um, and in the summer of their fourth year, they um, basically failed a, their very first elective rotation. And in, in digging into why that student had failed the rotation. It was actually a combination of things. It was a combination of um, intellectual preparedness as well as professional behavior. Um, the school, quite honestly, was a little bit surprised because they'd made it through all the hurdles all the way to the summer of fourth year. Um, however, failing an elective is a pretty serious issue, so the student um, was given an opportunity to repeat that elective with a, a different team, a different attending physician, and the student received a marginal pass. Um, the student was then put on academic probation, um, was required to do uh, another series of rotations, including a sub-internship. Um, the student failed the sub-internship, and the student was dismissed from the medical school. Well, I guess, you know, I'm going to just ask this group of people a really um, pointed question. And that question is one of the things that I have learned in um, moving from the, being the program director for a large residency program and going to the medical school, beginning with applicants to the medical school who are between 18 and 22 years old, is there is an awful lot of adult development that takes place in four years of medical school. And I personally feel a lot more committed to being as far as I can to the right on that support access to support the proper adult development. Now, the LCME says, we think the environment in which students learn is so important that we're going to make a standard, an accreditation standard about that. And so one of the things that I feel, and you've heard me say it at prior sessions of this group, that I feel a real personal responsibility for is this environment that our 18 to 22 year olds are learning medicine. And if you look at the literature on competencies, 
as students are doing things, and residents, doing things for the very first time, the anxiety levels are extremely high. The stress levels are extremely high. And the way a physician develops proficiency and competency is that they practice those things over and over and over. And as they practice, the stress comes down, the anxiety comes down, and they're able to be an outstanding professional. So I clearly don't want felons in the medical school. I, I, you know, I, I don't want people who can't hear feedback and change their behavior. But I'm gonna, if I'm invested in somebody who we've admitted, I'm going to do everything possible to help them through that professional development unless they're unteachable, unless they're unable to hear that feedback. Uh, as part of a residency program before I came, uh, as a faculty in a residency program before I came here, uh, we had a, 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 a student who had made the comment that my patient looks like XYZ during a presentation to an attending, which that attending was very upset about. The rest of the attendings might not have thought, might have this joke, right, and not have said anything. And there was a big debate of whether we should put that down on their evaluation as an off service rotation. We should say that, you know, they, this was, because one it was adamantly saying that. I can't tolerate this at all. But the rest were like, ah, well, you know, he was making a joke. You just took it the wrong way. You had a bad day. And so how far does that go back into well, what are my peers are going to say as opposed to what I believe or someone else might believe is a core ethical? Yeah, that's an excellent point. I'm really glad you raised it because we, um, that MSPE is actually a document that stays with the student for life. If they go apply for privileges in hospital XYZ 20 years from now and they call the medical school for um, an evaluation, that's the document they get. They get that and they get the University of Chicago transcript. That's it. So it's a very summative document. What you just described is what I put into the category of formative evaluation and feedback. And without formative evaluation and feedback, about the fact that that description of a patient was completely inappropriate and unacceptable, and here are the reasons why, and here's what I expect for tomorrow's presentation, the student would, would not have the opportunity to learn from their mistakes and to grow into the physicians that we can all be proud of. So formative evaluation has a very important place, equal to or bigger than the place of a summative evaluation. Oh, thank you. Great. <laughs>